Why does one plus one equal two? A common answer to this question is, when you have one apple and someone gives you another one, you have two apples. But this is not actually a proof, but rather a representational demonstration. The apple demonstration is only one of the cases that one plus one equal two represents, but it does not actually prove why this actually works this way. The fact that I can't prove the simplest problem on a textbook bothers me. So I spent time researching on how we can actually prove this equation. I discovered that one plus one equal two is actually not something derived, but that rather works this way because it is how people constructed the natural number set n. Things work this way because they are created to work this way. This idea surprised me. The world of math does not naturally exist, but rather, is, but is rather created. Two is not inherently bigger than one, three is not inherently bigger than two, but works this way because mathematicians attribute properties to symbols and digits. But how do the mathematicians attribute these properties? How is the system of math constructed? To find the answer to this, I'll walk you through the construction of the natural number system from the start. When we start to construct the natural number system, we put ourselves in a universe of complete emptiness. Nothing in the equation one plus one equal two is currently defined in this empty system. Now, we need to find the building blocks of our natural number system, which are the numbers. Namely, we are going to define what is one and what is two. So first of all, we need to put this one element inside this world of emptiness to secure our position in this empty universe. We call this element zero. Now, where are we going to put the other elements? How are we going to arrange them? Do we arrange them in a line with one element arranged after another? Or do we put them in a circle? Or do we just randomly throw in elements with like numbers scattered everywhere without any relationship with each other? We finally decided it to be a line with elements arranged one after another, each element's position secured on the previously arranged elements. And in order to make the end of the sequence pointing to infinity instead of back to zero, we give this, uh, we give this system a limitation. Zero is not the successor of any number. So what do I mean when I say successor? We define the successor to be the num newly added number whose, um, whose position is after the element we just arranged. Every number has the successor. We use the notation S of n to define the successor of n. Now, there's another probability that somewhere in the line, an element points back to a previously arranged element. So how are we going to prohibit this condition? We add a new limitation to the successors. Different numbers have different successors. Writing this in the mathematical language, we say, for all natural numbers m and n, m equals to n if and only if s of m equals s of n. Now, we compare the system we just constructed to the natural number system we are looking for. There are still things that are not right. So for one second, let's jump off, jump off the system under construction and use our developed knowledge of math to think. There are sequences like 1, 1 plus 2, 1.2, 1 1.4, 1.6, 1.8, or 1, 1 1.3, 1 1.6, 1 1.9 that also satisfy the above requirements. So how are we going to kick out these unwanted members of the natural number system? We add a new law to the system. If phi is a unary predicate such as phi of zero is true, and for every natural number n, phi of n being true implies that phi of s of n is true, then phi of n is true for every natural number n. So here, let me explain the term unary predicate. Unary means a single input function, and predicate means a Boolean value function. So here, unary predicate means we have this function whose input is one number, a natural number, and the function tells us whether the condition satisfy or not. So what does this law mean? It's basically telling us if we have this number n in the system and we know this is sat satisfy a condition. And by knowing this, we can also derive that s of n, which is its successor, also satisfies this condition. We can, and then we know that zero, which is the start of everything, satisfies this condition. We can derive the result that every natural number in the system satisfies this condition. 
This is more often referred to as induction, which is a crucial thing to build up the world of math. In fact, every theorem in arithmetic can basically be, de be derived from using the most basic successor operations using this law of induction. Now, let me quickly review what we just made for our world. First, zero is a natural number, and natural numbers are closed on their S. S is an injection. There's no natural number whose successor is zero, and finally, induction. All of these laws are called the piano axioms, but the axioms are not completed yet. Notice that in the equation, one plus one equals two, there are still elements that are undefined. These elements are plus and equals. So first, let me, uh, let me define what equality means. These are the four laws for equality. Basically, it is symmetric, transitive, and reflexive, and natural numbers are closed under equal equality. The next step, naturally, is to define what addition means. We use this law to define plus. A and B are natural numbers. A plus S of B equals S of A plus B, and um, A plus zero equals A. The definition for multiplication is pretty similar to the definition of addition. We have A and B natural numbers, and then we know A times zero equals zero, and A times S of B equals to A plus A times B. After defining all of these terms, we define one, we define plus, we define equal, we define two. We can finally prove why one plus one equal two. So um, this is pretty simple after all these definitions. We just use the definition for addition directly. We know A plus S of B equals S of A plus B. So we plug in A equals one and B equals zero. Thus, we have one plus S of zero equals S of one plus zero. We know that the successor of zero is one, so we know S of zero is one. So we have one plus one equals S of zero plus one. And by the definition of addition, we know A plus zero equals A. So we know S of one plus zero equals S of one, which is two, according to definition. So finally, we have one plus one equal two. But after defining all of these, why does this matter? What does understanding the true meaning behind arithmetic change for us? Like I said at the start of the talk, mathematical theory must fall back on facts that are proven, and piano axiom is, is the basis of all of these facts. Understanding the basic logic structures is very helpful for understanding what exactly is truth in math, and what makes up a well-developed theory Usually when we do proof, we prove things based on things that are already proven, and we invent new things based on existing inventions. And we do all, when we do all of these, we usually ignore the fact that we are using things that are proven, and we do not understand what truth actually means. We cannot just say something is true because it is intuitive. We need to actually prove it. Understanding how we construct the natural number system, I found this idea equally applicable to many other fields, both inside and outside the world of math. For example, probability. Many people may think probability is pretty easy to understand. You flip a coin, about half of the time it lands on heads, the other half tails. But when we say the probability, what do we mean by that? How do we define the chance of something happening? In fact, the concept of probability wasn't acknowledged by the math world until 1930s, when a Russian mathematician formally defined what probability spaces and random variables means using sigma algebras and measurable functions. In conclusion, when we think about math, about numbers, we take many things for granted. Things like one plus one equal two, or four is greater than three, seems to be natural and self-explanatory but they are actually the result of a system that is set up artificially. When we think about these, we need to understand what concepts truly means. Understanding how we construct the natural number system is very helpful for understanding what truth in math is in general, and this realization can help us with many other inspirations in our daily life. Understanding the basic logic structures behind a subject can help us to better utilize the knowledge we learn in the subject. 
Well, when we do not understand something completely and we use our unjustified and narrow idea about a subject, it might create trouble when we are diving into deeper topics. Thank you for listening.